Welcome back to the Nurturing Coach channel. This video is a compilation of five Facebook Lives that I did in my group and I wanted to put them together so that you had a full series all in one place. And we're going to be covering narcissistic parents and in particular looking at parenting styles, narcissistic traits, attachment, trauma and finally parental alienation. I do hope you find the series useful. If you want to skip forward to any parts, I have put the timestamp in the description below. Hey everyone, um, this is day one of the um, parent Narcissistic Parents series um, and we're going to look at five key areas and say it is parenting styles. In the normal population, there's, there's three main parenting styles which are passive, authoritarian and authoritarian and authoritative. And I always stumble over that one. So, and what those means is um, an authoritative parent is one who they know how to have fun with their kids, but they also know how to set boundaries. And that tends to be where we would like most parents to be. An authoritarian parent is very much about the rules and respect and kind of like an army sergeant um, uh, parent. I didn't want to say father, a parent. Um, and then the passive is the parent that struggles to enforce boundaries, struggles to um, look at consequences, struggles with discipline, and is very much, um, they allow the child to pretty much dictate what's going on in the family. And like I say, the main one we go for is the authoritative one, because that's, it's better for all those involved, it's better for the parents, because they are the ones who are in control, but not in a not in a awful way. But they are the authoritative figure within the family who sets the rules, who um, keeps the family safe and protective. But equal, they know how to have fun with them. They know that um, they have a good relationship and they are nurturing as part of that. Obviously, in narcissistic families, we have a couple of extra what I would call categories of parenting. The first one of that is the engulfing parent. And the engulfing parent is one who is totally joined at the hip with their child. There's no boundaries between what the child wants and what the parent wants. The only voice that is heard is that of the parent. You find this a lot in parental alienation cases because the parent transmits all of their trauma, transmits all of their feelings, they project everything that they've been through, everything that they feel onto the child and basically uses the child as their mouthpiece, essentially. And so the engulfing parent is the one that they are, they go everywhere together, there's no independence, they tell them what to do. And a lot of people from the outside looking in will think, oh, isn't that nice? They get on so well, they do everything together. And actually, that's not how a parent-child relationship should be. It should be that parents hang out with people their own age, children hang out with people their own age, but as a family unit, they all come together. But it's not about the friendship or the control. It's um, And that's what you find in an engulfing parent, that they engulf the child, essentially. They take all of their individuality, they take it away, and they expect the child to become them. The other uh, narcissistic parenting style is the rejecting, neglecting parent, which is often what happens with the scapegoat child. So the engulfing is more around the golden child, and for the scapegoated child, it's they're pushed away, they're not really listened to at all, they're not even, they don't even notice really that they're there, they don't meet their needs in the slightest, and that child will probably they'll feel incredibly lonely within the family because they'll see the golden child who gets all this attention and then they will get nothing and again this is another parenting style of the narcissist that they don't know how to love they don't know how to 
have empathy they don't know how to provide emotional warmth for the child so they go to extremes they're either engulfing where they make that child the center of everything their mini me or they're rejecting now what also to, that plays a part in this is that our parenting style is very much correlated to our attachment styles and what that's essentially saying is we parent how we were parented, which makes absolute sense. We learn from what we experience. And again, there's four main. Um, the first one is the um, secure attachment. And this is very nurturing. They provide a safe environment for their children to grow, develop. There's arguments, but they're dealt with. Everyone is appreciated, respected for who they are. They're allowed to develop. Their individuality is celebrated. And it's a really, like I say, nurturing environment for the child. The next one is one of the insecure attachment styles, and this is the ambivalent. And this is where the, they are so scared of being abandoned that they become engulfing. Um, and so they, they, they wrap everything up into that child and they make that child not want to leave them. They're, they're very, they're very afraid parents. They're not, they're not necessarily narcissistic in that but they are very much afraid of what so if if the narcissistic parent has experienced that as a child then their their, their parent would have been glued at their hip and you probably find as adults they're very close to one parent um, and it's it's weird it makes you think that's a bit odd that they're a bit close the next um attachment style is the avoidant which is they don't have anything to do with the kids and this is the rejecting neglecting style um because they were never shown that love that their, their parents were pushed them away they didn't bother with them they didn't meet any of their needs and so that's how they parent they parent so they don't they don't know how to meet the needs they don't bother they're not they're not interested um and obviously that can leave the children feeling horrible about themselves feel very unloved and the final one is the disorganized attachment style, which is scary. This is where a parent is the figure that they are terrified of. And actually, the whole purpose of attachment is for us to be protected, for us to be kept safe from predators. But in disorganized attachment, our parent becomes the predator. And with narcissists, they're all three of those. They have elements of all of them. They are sometimes scared of attachment. They're, they are sometimes scared of abandonment. Equally, sometimes they're not interested in the slightest. And often they're very scary. So those three elements combined make it very difficult for a child to grow up with a narcissistic parent. So if you're trying to co-parent with one of these, it's important that you understand how they were parented themselves, what their style is, because you can you can help your children to understand what they're what they're growing up in and what you if you know that they're experiencing all of those things, you can obviously be the secure attachment. In parental alienation cases, it's important that we recognise that these are the attachment styles because they can help build our cases, they can help look for assessments on what we're what we're honing in on so that we can identify those styles. If you're a child who's been raised by a narcissist, you're going to identify with all of those things. You're going to identify with how you were raised, those behaviours, how that parent made you feel. So it's a really good basis for us starting to understand exactly what narcissistic parenting is and how it presents and how it makes children feel. Evening everyone, this is part two of our series on narcissistic parents. And today we're going to look at the narcissistic traits themselves and how they impact on parenting. And these are the traits taken out of the DSM um, guide for personality disorders. So this is the clinical diagnosis criteria. And we're going to look at what it means in terms of how they parent. So the first one is they react to criticism with feelings of rage, stress, or humiliation. And obviously, as adults, we've experienced that, but for children, children who naturally and innocently will criticize, they don't necessarily mean it in a nasty way, but if, if tea stinks, they'll tell you it does. If you're not very good at something, they'll tell you it does. 
and most of us as parents can take it on the chin and we laugh it off. Narcissists can't do that because in narcissist eyes, it's a criticism of their who they believe they are, who they want to be, not who they really are, but who they want to be. And so they react in a very strong way, and that can be really upsetting for the child because the last thing they want to do is upset them, and they'll be very confused because they were just being honest and they're criticized for that. And yet, we're taught at schools, we're taught in every other way to be honest and truthful, and yet, when they are, they're punished for doing that. So, it's really hard, and it's a really strong form of um, a, um, manipulation on the part of the narcissist because the um, and so. Children learn very quickly to withhold those feelings, to basically not say what they would naturally want to say because they, they're fearful of what reaction they may get. And that's very sad. It's not nice for children to grow up in that environment where they can't be honest, they can't be authentic. They have to monitor everything that comes out of their mouth, every action that they have, every micro expression because it will hurt the narcissist's feelings. The next one is that they are interpersonally exploitative, taking advantage of others to achieve his or her own needs. Now, this is for a, um, as a parent, this is, I suppose, there's a few ways that we can look at this. The first one is a narcissist will happily use their own children to meet whatever their ends are. If, it, if they want to be seen as being beautiful or successful, they will use their child to promote that status. If they want to be seen as being the perfect parent or the perfect partner, they will use that child to pass on that message, to tell everyone that that's what they are. If they want to exact revenge, they will use that child through parental alienation. They have no qualms about hurting anyone, including their own children, to get what they want. As far as they're concerned, the ends justify the means, as long as they, they're not hurting anymore. And as a parent, that's the exact opposite of what we should be doing. Nurturing, loving, secure parents will, do, will go to the ends of the earth to protect their child from feeling any pain. But a narcissist parent, they, they, they wouldn't outwardly say that they don't love them or that they will use them, but it just it's natural to them. It's natural to them to treat but anyone, including their children, in that way. The next one is they have a grandiose sense of self-importance. So within a family unit, they are the matriarch. They are the one who dictates what happens. They have to have control over every little thing. And obviously, as kids grow up, they push against boundaries. They naturally want to assert themselves. They're learning about the world. And there's going to be arguments. And the narcissist cannot and will not tolerate that. And so when when their children narcissists reach teenagers, that, that, can, that can be really explosive. And it be, can become violent because the children, if they've not been totally brainwashed at, by this point, they may start to fight back. And I mean literally fight back. And so that can be a really dangerous environment and a really dangerous time. The other element, of course, is that if the narcissist is going around with all this, I'm amazing, I'm the best, I'm this, that, and the other, the child will automatically think they're the best, they're amazing, they're this, and they will have this very twisted view of themselves, which when they go to school, nursery, other people will see that, yeah, they are brilliant, but they're not the best. What if they lose? What if they're in a competition or a test and they don't win. They struggle with that because they're constantly being in this environment where they must be the best. And so it can be really hard and they really struggle with any failures. They really struggle with criticism themselves. And you can see how the circle back into narcissism is developing through that behavior. The next one is they believe their problems are unique and understood only by other special people and you find this a lot with narcissists that um I'm, i always make make this joke and i don't mean to belittle in any way but if any of you've seen um i think it's a monty python sketch but don't quote me on that where it's my problems are worse than your problems and it's very much like that with a narcissist that no matter what you're feeling they felt it 10 times worse they will belittle everything that you're going through and only the best, only the top. So if they've if they 
broke their leg, they wouldn't just see a normal doctor. They'd have to see a specialist doctor. Whether they did or didn't is regardless. That they, they will tell everyone that that's what they've done. So when it comes to um, how that impacts their parenting, they will be very. They can be very pushy parents. They can be that they need absolutely the teacher in the classroom isn't good enough for them special little Johnny or Jessica or whoever, they have to have the best. And this can really alienate a child from their peers because the child essentially just wants to fit in. And the narcissist, that's not good enough if they're in any class, if they're in any groups, after school groups, they'll be pushing them to have the best equipment, the best this, that, and the other. Everything has to be special and unique, even when it's not. And that can be really difficult for the child who, like I say, essentially wants to just, they want to fit in and they want to find their own way in the world. One of the biggest gifts we can give to our kids is actually encouraging them to be exactly who they want to be. Masters can't allow them to do that. Nadine, I'm really sorry and I apologise if anything we're saying is triggering you. If, you. if it does, then obviously don't. Don't watch it. I don't want to cause any more pain to you. I'm hoping because the series educates, but I don't want to cause any more harm. Um, so if it is too much, then obviously do do switch up. The next one is preoccupied by fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. Um, and I find this particularly in um, parental alienation cases that you will often find that. Um, the parent who is alienating will imply and make out that the relationship they have with their children is the best. They are best friends, they are intuitive, they just know each other so well, they think the same. But what happens is, going back to the how they react to criticism on the first one, is the child simply is projecting what the narcissist wants. It's not what the child wants, it's what the narcissist wants. The narcissist interprets that as being, we're so in tune, we, um, oh yeah, we think exactly the same. And actually, no, the child is just regurgitating what you've taught them, not thinking independently whatsoever. And that, again, children want to find their own voice in the world. We need to encourage our children to feel confident to say how they, they think and they feel. And narcissists can't handle that because they have to, everyone has to think and feel the same as them because they are right. Even when they're a million times wrong and presented with evidence to the contrary, they are right. And you can't, you can't survive in that world. You can't survive in a world where everything you do is wrong and everything someone else does is right. But when you, it, it's twisted. It really is very twisted because they will, um, you can, you, they can say to you, um, oh, what, what color is the sky to, to a child? They can say to a child, oh, what color is the sky? And the child will go, it's blue. And the narcissist will go, no, it's not. No, it's not. So then the child will be, oh, right, okay. No, the, the sky is green. So next time the narcissist says to the child, what colour is the sky? The narcissist will, uh, the child will answer, oh, it's green, it's green, thinking I've got the right answer here. I know, I, know, I know what it is, I remember from last time. But the narcissist has twisted even more, their reality has changed. So they're, no, it's not, for God's sake, why, why can't you see what colour the sky is? What colour is, and so eventually what happens is the child will say, I don't know. What colour is the sky? What colour do you think it is? And then when the narcissist goes, I think it's red, the child will go, yes, I think it's red too. It's, so the child doesn't think that the sky is red, but they've learned that the only response is to agree. And this is what happens, not just in French alienation cases, but in narcissistic families as a whole. Like I said, one person will dictate what everyone else thinks, and that's how they do it. They they do it by having this idealized view as well that they are they, they are right all the time. In terms of the um, success, power, brilliance, then that every the child will have feel the pressure of that. The child will feel the pressure to be the same. They will be exactly 
what they think the narcissist wants to be. There's no freedom in a narcissistic family to become whatever you want to be. You have to become what the narcissist wants you to be. And you'll never be as good as them. You'll always be criticised. You you won't do it right. And so uh, gradually you just get worn down and worn down and worn down. And you, you hand the reins of your life over because it's easier than the constant arguments. Um, they also tend to when relationships break down is they can actually make the child their surrogate partner. They put a lot of their emotional wants, needs, fears onto the child, which again, it's, it's psychological abuse because the child isn't equipped to deal with that. The child is a child. It's not an adult. It doesn't have those feelings. It doesn't have that cognitive ability to understand an adult relationship. And yet they're forced to, to do that. And that can lead to other elements such as sexual abuse. Um, they have a sense of entitlement and unreasonable expectations of especially favor favorable treatment. It's pretty much some of what I said what I just said, that they they believe that everyone should treat them special. They believe that so, so when they would go to a parents evening, then they kind of walk in like they're the king. <laughs> everyone should bow down to them, all queen. And so everyone should bow down to them and everyone should think that, oh, they're so-and-so's mum or dad. Oh, they're amazing and they're wonderful and it's great. They want everyone's attention. And um, people think that that means that they're very um, all about the physical appearance. And it's not. It's about that, look at me, I'm incredible, I'm amazing, I'm powerful. That's what they're, they're going for. And they, they, they push that all the time in every area of their life, particularly onto their children. So you might have parents who are really strict. A lot of narcissist parents can be really, like we talked yesterday, really authoritarian. They very much, this is how it's done, rule home like a prison, because they want everything done their way and they expect everyone to do it their way. They expect their children to be super special because if they're not then that reflects badly on them that's how they see it if my child isn't amazing then people will think i'm not amazing and so they have all these unrealistic expectations of everyone around them and they require constant attention and admiration from their children and that's the wrong way around in a normal relationship with a with a baby the adult the parent gives all their attention to that child. And as they're growing and as the attachment develops, there's a back and forth. The child cries, the parent responds. But in a narcissistic relationship, the parent cries, the child responds. And so therefore attachments can't be formed that are secure, they're very disorganized because they're back to front. That's not how relationships between parents and children should be. And they need that throughout that child's life. That child becomes their crutch, their emotional crutch. They lean on them for everything. And they, like I just said, they're not mentally able to do that. They're children. That's not their role. They're not there. They become a thermometer to the narcissist's emotional dysregulation. So every time the narcissist looks like they're going to teeter over the edge and lose the plot or go mad, the, ch the child will do everything they can to console them, like I said, twisted, because it should be when the child is upset, the parent responds. Um, next one is a lack of empathy, um, inability to recognize ex experience how others feel. Yeah, so on top of the fact that they need the admiration themselves, they're not able to give that. So when, the child, when a baby cries, as parents, we naturally, we feel that. It breaks our heart to hear our child cry, but we kind of, we learn, is that food cry? Is it a tired cry? Is it just a, a miss you cry? And we respond accordingly. It takes a bit of practice, but we get there. And this is this innate desire to want to do that. We, we want to mend that. We don't want them to cry when we feel that pain that they're in, and so we try and fix it. Narcissists can't do that. Narcissists can't recognise that that child is upset. It, to them, it's an annoyance and a noise. It's not a sign of sadness or anything. It's a, and you'll you'll hear that in the way they speak to children is they'll assign very adult traits to very childish behaviour. So a crying child 
is a nuisance and a noise and they'll say why can't it just shut up doesn't it know i'm trying to do this and it's like it's a baby how how is it supposed to know that and it's just it, it's just because they cut they are completely unable to recognize that there's any um there's any emotions they can't recognize other people's emotions they can't recognize their own children's emotions so and it's an, an annoyance to them so if um, i'm saying an older child comes back and they're on a terrible day at school and they're really upset they've had a big argument with their best friend they've done terrible in the test all those things and they come in and they're really downtrodden and they look really upset that's just won't won't look now what they'll be angry at is the fact that they've not asked them how their day has been they've not asked them what's going on they've not asked them how they're feeling they won't recognize that that child is upset and that's really damaging because you end up feeling very worthless you end up feeling invisible and this is what a lot of children in narcissists end up feeling is that they're just nobodies and so they then crave the wrong attention as they go through life unfortunately and the final one is preoccupied with feelings of envy and i hear this time and time again i've experienced it on a personal level the narcissist is jealous of their own children. They will say, oh, you love them more than me. You give them more attention than me. They will look at them with disdain when you are giving them attention because, as previously we talked, they want all that attention. They want all the admiration. So having children is seen, um, they, they, will do, they will have children because it meets a particular need that they have at that moment in time. But... As far as they're concerned, as that child begins to grow, they become an absolute bane. Unless they can use that child in some way, that child is their enemy. That child is someone to be jealous of their competition. And that's, again, that's not how you feel about your kids. Your kids are special. Your kids are wonderful. You want the best for your kids. You'd sacrifice everything for them. But the narcissist won't do that. Evening everyone, it's a beautiful day here in Lincoln, so I thought I would come and sit out in the conservatory to do tonight's live. Um, it's the third of our series, um, so far we've covered parenting styles and yesterday we covered the narcissistic traits. And today I want to sort of join those dots together a little bit as we look at their attachment styles. And as I mentioned in video on Monday, their attachment style is disorganised. So essentially what that means for a child is that they want to be attached to their parent because primarily our, then the attachment comes about because we need to survive. In the wild, if, um, if a baby lion didn't attach itself to its parents, it would be left out of the pride and therefore it would be in danger and it would get killed by predators. So our primary biological purpose of attaching to our parents is for survival. But when your parent is scary and is quite predatory in their behavior, we're torn. We're torn between needing to attach for survival and being terrified of the person that we're having to attach to. And that is where the um, narcissist's um, attachment styles come from. That's the upbringing that they've more often than not had is that they've been terrified of their parent but equally they've known they've had to attach to them and then they've been parented in perhaps an engulfing or a neglecting style and then this is then passed down through the generations and as, as i've spoken about before this is something that's known as the um multi-generational transmission process which is a very quick off the tongue thing but it's essentially that we we pass down our attachment styles we pass down our beliefs about who we are how relationships work how the world works to our children and this gets passed down from generation to generation so if you're a child of a narcissist then you equally will be feeling both scared of your narcissist parent but an attachment to them because you have to attach to that child and that's essentially it creates a really um dichotomous relationship because on the one hand they're your parent and you want to love them and you want a relationship with them partly in a biological sense but equally on an emotional sense that we want to be loved by our parents we want that love we want that relationship with them because it, it makes us feel good about ourselves and it builds a strong internal working model. 
But unfortunately, with a narcissist parent, what happens is they're unable to attach to us in a healthy way. And so that fear comes through. It comes through from the child to the parent and the parent to the child. So both are communicating that they're scared and both are, both are withdrawing then. So it becomes a very in-out relationship that they want the relationship, but they don't. And this is also known as the fear of abandonment. And it's a borderline personality element as well, is that they're terrified of being left. And you'll find this with children of narcissists is that they can be incredibly clingy to the nurturing parent, but also sometimes to the narcissist as well, because they crave that attention. And I know in parental alienation cases that often people are very confused as to, well, if they're so terrible to them, why are they, why do they say that they love them? Why do they want to be with them? Because actually that's part of their attachment style that they want to be they want to love them they're terrified of being on their own they're a child they shouldn't have to face the world on their own but it is a borderline personality um element which narcissistic people can have there's also the narcissistic anxiety that's attached to this as well which is that people might start to see that they're not quite as great the, the children might start to realize that they're not as great as they're making out to be that this fragile inner self that they try so hard to hide that the child might realize that and so they can be quite offhandish they can push them away or they can be very um aggressive because they don't want the child to see they, they want to brainwash that child essentially into believing that they are what the narcissist wants them to see that they are when it's not the truth and so they can do that rather than the majority of us normal healthy individuals we we want people to like us for who we are we want them to see the real us because partly because it's exhausting wearing a mask all the time but we want them we want that validation that we are good human beings and and we are true to ourselves and we want to be our authentic selves. Narcissists don't want to be their authentic self because they've been taught through their own childhood experiences that that's not a good person to be, that won't get any love, that won't get any attention, that will get abandoned. And so they try really hard to be someone they're, they're not and they force that onto the child as well. And this is really unfair on the children because we already have... as in our natural development, we have this built-up picture of our parents. They're heroes, they're our protectors, they're our carers, they're all of these things. And But with a narcissist, this role that they're in is exaggerated. They become omnipotent, all-powerful. They tell you what to do, how to do it. Everything is their way. And it's all part of this anxiety that they don't want anyone, including their own children, to see the real fragile self and the final part of the puzzle is their own trauma reenactment as we've been through they've had a difficult upbringing themselves their parents have either been engulfing so that they weren't able to breathe they weren't even to find their own independence they weren't able to decide who they were in life what role they wanted to play make their own decisions really they weren't even to even able to form their own identity or they were um, neglected or rejected, in which case they decided that they, were, they weren't worthy of anything. And they probably flipped between the two. Some days they were engulfed and some days they were rejected because the narcissist is very up and down. And the children will experience the exact same thing as through the uh, multi-generational transmission crisis. The children of narcissists will be treated in the exact same way as the narcissist was treated themselves, partly because we, only, we learn how to parent from our own parents. And so it's so important if you if you are a child of a narcissist, it's important that you recognize that you recognize that you could well repeat this cycle because it's part of your genetics and your attachment style. But you can change this. And as you're experiencing issues, you're trying to heal, you're going to be addressing these issues. These are the sort of things that for you to be looking at. These are the sort of things for you to be working through with a counsellor or a therapist is looking at how do you view yourself? How do you view the world around you? How do you view your relationships with others? And trying to work towards a much more positive view of those things so that you can create more secure attachments. And if 
you're co-parenting with a narcissist and you're trying to um, create resilience in your child, being aware that this is how they treat children, this is how they attach to them, this is what's going to happen to your child, the messages this has been sending means that you can do everything you can to counterbalance that. You can provide that nurturing, secure attachment. And it's factually proven that the power of a secure attachment is incredibly strong and can wrong and can right a lot of wrongs. Sorry, I've got that the wrong way now. So by creating that resilience, by nurturing them, by loving them, by securely attaching with your child, encouraging them to know who they are, accepting them for everything that they are, really giving them the strength to find out who are you? What do you enjoy in life? What do you want to be? What do you want to be known as? Helping them to answer those questions is something that will massively help them as they move through life. I do hope you found that useful. I personally find it fascinating. and I think the more that we understand about the psychology of narcissists and people with personality disorders, the more we can protect both ourselves and our children. And that's what this series is all about. So I do hope that you're getting a lot of value from it. As Good evening, everyone. Another beautiful day here in Lincoln, but I'm not sat outside this evening. So um, I wanted to talk today about trauma and it, the role that it plays with narcissistic parents. So we're going to look at it from both the narcissist perspective and um, a child of a narcissist as well. So as the narcissistic parent, um, they probably experienced trauma as a child. It may be that it was attachment trauma, very likely there was developmental trauma, and there may even be some medical trauma or um, community trauma in there as well. We don't know without knowing their history, but trauma would have played a part. And the thing about trauma is that it affects the way our brains develop. It affects the neural pathways within our heads. It can um, it can create sensory issues. It can it massively create emotional, social, and behavioural difficulties. And so, trauma plays a massive role in personality development. And so not trauma alone is can cause a heck of a lot of damage and cause a heck of a lot of health problems and as, as if you're if you've been in a relationship with a narcissist um, or you're a child of a narcissist then you know the impact that trauma has you you're probably suffering with post-traumatic stress disorder and you know the feelings that, that that gives you obviously what happens with the development of the narcissistic personality disorder is there's lots of other things that tap into that so it's not trauma alone that causes narcissism um, and this is important to remember um, if you're a child of a narcissist or if you're trying to co-parent with a narcissist is that your child will be experiencing trauma you will have experienced trauma that doesn't mean that you're going to turn into a narcissist um, but obviously what those experiences are traumatic and they can impact the brain so the best things for you to do if you're if you're trying to recover from that is to to do quite for me it's been doing lots of mind body work so focusing on i'm sorry i've got the hiccups focusing on um controlling your thoughts so recognizing when you're having a negative thought and trying to basically get get hold of that so you don't spiral i I'm, i was a terrible spiraler i'd start off with one thought but within five minutes I'd, the world was ending because my thought just went on and on and on and on and on some people catastrophize so what starts out as a relatively small issue can become massive and you, you find narcissists do that quite a bit but you can also do that as a victim as well um and so for me getting hold of that doing meditation doing regular meditation really slowing myself down really being aware of what was going on in my body and in my head really helped me to get get a grip of that and if you're if you're a child of a narcissist or you're or um, trying to co-parent with a narcissist and you have a child with them, teaching them this early on, teaching them mindfulness is actually a really great coping mechanism for them. It's a recognized treatment model for PTSD. Um, so for narcissistic parents, 
trauma is both received as in it as what they what they had as a child and given being being around a narcissist is traumatic you are hyper vigilant all the time because you never know what's going to happen next the the it can be very extremes you are, feel like you're living in a war zone and for children that is a trauma war trauma is actually part an official part of trauma and so being in a relationship with narcissists is very similar in my eyes to that war trauma. It is literally like living on the edge, not knowing when the next blast is going to go off, not knowing whether you're safe, but knowing that you have to try and stay safe. You have to try and stay with someone to keep you safe. And it can be really, really damaging for children. Like I say, it can cause massive problems because we release chemicals. We release cortisol being the main one, but nenephrine is also a um, chemical that we release when we're under stress. And our bodies were designed to have that in our, on, in our systems for long periods of time. They're brilliant for that short release where they flight or fight. So they kick in the adrenal glands so that we, we suddenly get this burst of, right, what do I do? And our brain fires up and our body, we, our, our heart rate goes up and we, we react to our environment. And that's a safety process. That's, that was put in, put in as it's part of our, our biological development as human beings to protect us from a predator. So we have this response to keep us safe. Obviously, we have developed so we're not living on the plains of africa anymore and there's lines everywhere but when you're in a narcissistic relationship or you have a narcissistic parent actually you are living in that same environment where there is every, a potential threat every time you're around them it is incredibly traumatic and um and so trauma plays a massive part in narcissistic families narcissistic parents and in narcissists themselves so like i said for children who are being raised within this environment the best things that we can do is to do our best to limit that is to try and teach them those methods to reduce that stress on a daily basis so that so that we reduce those chemical levels because high high stress can actually cause a premature death there's and it sounds horrendous and horrific but i can't i can't sugarcoat that that is a fact High levels of long-term chronic stress can cause death alongside many other horrible conditions, heart attacks, strokes, um, I have ME, fibromyalgia. There's a lot of, there's a range of conditions that are brought about due to stress. Um, and it can start off with something as simple as a lot of headaches, a lot of stomach ache, which you find children in narcissistic families often suffer with headaches and belly aches quite regularly and it's the stress it's that it's that unnatural react long-term reaction to having those chemicals in their system is putting a strain on their normal bodily functions um hi melanie and so um for children to help them it's really important that we teach them how to manage that day-to-day -day stress before it does turn into that long-term trauma so like I've mentioned, meditation, yoga is also a really good one. Exercise, eating healthily, all the things that, you know, all the things that most of us turn our names apart, but actually they're incredibly good for you in your, when you're in stressful positions because we need to feed our bodies right. We need to be putting the right um, chemicals back in our body to counterbalance those, the, the cortisol and the nephrine that are doing damage because they're in our systems too long. So, Good healthy foods is a is a great place to start. Relaxation, so yoga, meditation, um, reading, exercise, all those things to help maintain a, a more um, healthy chemical balance in your body. Also help you with sleep, sleep deprivation massively. It, it kicks into it as well. You find when with children narcissists, sleeping can be an issue. It might be that they sleep too much because they're suffering with depression or their or their um, body is actually fighting all the time, so it's tired all the time, or they don't sleep at all because they're hypervigilant. So helping them to get into a good sleep pattern is really important. You find that sometimes when they come back, when they come back from visiting, they can their sleep can be a little bit woo, and that's part of it is that they're, they're just either hyper alert or 
and they've been their body's been releasing all these chemicals that actually then they're, they're worn out um so there's some things there that you can do to help your child to to deal with that if you're an adult child of them exactly the same exactly the same they um there are medications that you can take i personally would look at the natural route where possible but obviously if um if you want to if if you feel that meds are the way to go forward i took meds i'm not anything against them i took meds until i could get myself into the place they're great at dealing with the crisis and getting you out of that getting to you, you to a place where you feel that you can start tackling this by yourself but where possible it does come down to the mind body connection and, and learning how to how to stop letting your brain control and your emotions control you which is what happens in these situations we're so we're so bombarded with information and so bombarded with um, negativity from the narcissist that it's there it's it's really hard to to take control of that because your brain is just responding to what's there but actually and I used to think it's impossible because I can't it's happening what do you want me to do it's happening what can I do about it and I've learned so much obviously I've had lots going on with my dad and if it wasn't for my brain my body work that I've been doing I wouldn't have coped and I I mean I haven't been I haven't been perfect my, my body has taken a bit of a bit of a beating but I'm a million, million gazillion times better than I could be. And I'm not on any meds. I've done this all through trying to master my own thought processes. And so it really does work. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, got, I don't have shares in meditation or anything. I'm telling you this purely because it works for me. Um, but like I say, um, now meds do work. Meds do work because they deal with the chemical imbalances in your brain and they are brilliant. You're feeling I can't cope, I can't shut down, I can't sleep, I'm not doing this. Get to the doctors, get prescribed, and help let them help you to level yourself out. Once you're at that point where you feel, and you will, you'll get to the point where you think, okay, I think I'm okay now, I think I'm level. And I would always recommend meds and. If you look at any treatment model for anything, it's always meds and. Very rarely do we just do meds. Meds and. So take your meds, but look at what else you can do. Look how you can manage it, because eventually the idea will be to come off the meds and you take control. So work on your meditation, work on your relaxation, and you really will find that it gets better. And do do those things with your kids as well, modeling how to do it, how to help them deal with it. Um, another element of um, trauma and the narcissist is that they often relive trauma in their relationships. So. What can often happen is the trauma that they experience as a child, they'll project into the current relationship and they will paint you as the parent or um, they'll paint the other parent as the abuser from their childhood and the child as this victim that needs protecting. So you may be part of that triangle that you were used in the middle of that battle. You were you were passed from pillar to post and made to feel made to feel pretty much like um, a battering ram, some sort of weapon to hurt someone, and that does nothing for your self confidence. It makes you feel horrible, and or you may be trying to co-parent, and that's exactly what they're doing to you. They're they're making you out to be the abuser and your child to be the victim that they have to protect. Um, when I say protect, I mean how a narcissist protects, which is essentially controlling them, telling them what to do, which is what they would have done to you. In their eyes, in their eyes, that's part of their how they protect is telling you what to do. It's protecting themselves by protecting you. It's that twisted projection that they always do. Um, so you you do find that a lot. You find that trauma reenactment where they they're reliving past pains, particularly in high stress. So if you're having difficulties with a relationship or there's a divorce or a separation, this is when these behaviours will kick in. There's a lot more about that, and I, I'm not going to go into it in any more great depth. So you know the triangle, the abuser, the victim, the protector triangle. That's what this is about. They're playing into that um, by twisting all the roles within it.
Good evening. Um, this is the final episode of our Narcissistic Parents series. Tonight we're going to look at parental alienation. And I want to bring in a couple of other characteristics that in my research on parental alienation, in my personal experience of it, I found them to be um, prominent, but and then a couple of extra ones as well that I think they're quite common among narcissistic parents, but they're definitely very common in um, parental alienation. Parental alienation, um, there's three main levels of parental alienation, mild, moderate, and severe. The mild is essentially where you just got a paid off parent who is hurting and blindly, but not maliciously, thinks that using the kids is the best way to exact their revenge, but can easily be um, talked around. They can be, it can, they will listen to the fact that actually you need to put your kids' needs first, we understand, and there isn't that psychological element to it. Moderate, they're a little bit more hell-bent, and the, the likelihood is there's maybe a, an anxiety or a depression, so, so a level of mental um, health issues, but on the whole, again, with the right support, the right therapy, they they can parental alienation can can be reduced and, and stopped. The final, the most severe cases of parental alienation, in my experience, there is always a narcissistic or borderline personality disorder present. And what you find is it's either a narcissistic personality disorder with borderline traits or a per borderline personality disorder with narcissistic traits. So we're going to we're going to look at that today. But first of all, I'm going to talk about some of these four traits um, parenting traits that I've found. First one is infantilizing. And this is when um, the narcissist parent will treat the child much younger than they actually are they don't want them to grow up they don't want them to develop their independence because obviously they can't control them at that stage and they want to keep them at an age where they um they they, they need them it's a very I mean, this is a borderline characteristic um because borderlines are very much afraid of being abandoned so when they infantilize their child they're keeping them an age where they're dependent upon them. Um, and so it's a, it's a way of keeping them under their control, keeping them close to them. And what follows on from that is something called enmeshment, which is you get this with families where certain people, obviously um, a parent and a child are too close, too close, that uncomfortable closeness that you feel. and it's because there's no emotional boundaries between them. What's happened in the narcissistic personality has taken over. So the child is only expressing the views of the narcissist parent. People see them and go, oh, well, they wouldn't, they're so close. Oh, they're just, they're just, they're, they get, they really get each other, but it's not. It's enmeshment, which is very psychologically damaging because. You want to grow up to be an individual. We all have our own personalities. We all have our own um, uniqueness. And when you're enmeshed to someone, that's not allowed to develop. You have to become the mini me of them. You have to become think like them, do like them, be like them. There's no room for you in saying, thinking anything on your own. And that's it's that's essentially it's psychological maltreatment isn't it because a huge part of child development is developing your own personality and um, the next one that that comes up quite a lot is Munchausen's um Munchausen's by proxy so Munchausen's is in the UK it's now been changed to fabricated illness syndrome and you find that narcissists will use this for themselves they'll they they will say to get sympathy from other people to and borderline personalities will do it as well to prevent someone from leaving or to gain sympathy to play the victim they will say that there's something wrong with them um, and there'll be lots of different illnesses none of which usually get diagnosed but they will say that but equally what happens particularly in parental alienation cases is 
they will say that there's something wrong with the child. You'll find that children are regularly taken to doctors, specialists, because one, the narcissist feels they're very special, so the child has to go through all these tests because they know best. But but also that the attention that that child gets is also attention that the adult, the narcissist gets, and so it's a very very common feature and also they use it in parental alienation as an excuse as to why the other parent part can't possibly meet the needs of this child the way i do i'm the one that takes care of them i'm the one that does this and they'll use it to keep the other parent at bay um the next one is parentification which is the opposite of infantilizing and this is where they will um basically put the child in an adult role and again, this happens a lot in parental alienation where the child becomes the surrogate partner. So when the relationship is intact, the, the um, non-narcissist parent would have been like the emotional barometer in there. They would have tried to keep the narcissist mood level every time they felt that, oh, they sensed in the air that something wasn't quite right. They would act to try and ensure that there was no rage, there was no... Um, silent treatment they would do everything they could to keep the narcissist on a level when that relationship ends separation and, and divorce the child takes on that role the child becomes the surrogate spouse the emotional barometer and so they have to read they have to essentially read and like i spoke before about in the attachment one this is the exact opposite of what should be happening in a parent-child relationship the normal parent-child relationship is the parent responds to the emotions of the child. The child cries, the parent responds. And it's this back and forth where you grow and you develop that attachment. But with a narcissistic parent, the, ch the uh, narcissist has an emotional response and it's the child who has to deal with that. It's the child who has to comfort, the child who has to um, nurture them. And the child doesn't have the capability to do that. The child has not developed not only within that within that parenting capacity, but also from an age point of view. These these children are not equipped to be psychological barometers, and it's not fair. That's not their role. It, it, like I said, it's the absolute reverse of what should happen in a healthy healthy relationship. And again, it ticks the box for psychological maltreatment. So what happens in parental alienation cases with the narcissist is the narcissist is unable to cope with separation and divorce because when any relationship breaks down, we feel guilt. We feel that we're partly to blame. We feel that we must have made a mistake. And nine times out of ten, we can learn something from that. We can look at ourselves and, and go, you know what, I've learned for next time or I've learned about myself that, that this is how I react to that or I did I maybe should I could improve on this because because we all want to develop and we all want to improve but the narcissist cannot accept that they are in any way to blame and in order to do that they have to project all of their insecurities onto the other parent and so in doing that that means that you must become all bad there is no goodness left in you you are all bad and they are all good because they have that splitting dynamic. They have that, um, they've, they've grown up in an environment where they've been treated in the same way. We've looked at trauma. So they have grown up to develop this split um, between what they should what they should attach to. This is a disorganized attachment. What they should attach to, they should attach to a parent, but they're scared of the parent. So there's this splitting dynamic where they can't be. Someone can't be both good and bad. They literally have their attachment motivation switched on or they have their protection motivation switched on. And, and so they, when the separation happens, their avoidant, their protection mechanism goes into full force and you become the enemy. You become the predator in that, in that situation. And so you become all bad. Also, it means that they can tell everyone how terrible you are, how wonderful they are. No blame. They did nothing wrong. The relationship only broke down because you were the problem. There's no, well, yeah, it's probably six and one half a dozen of the other. It's 
all you. It maintains their role as either the hero or the victim. And so once you are all bad, we can then slip back into that trauma triangle that I talked about yesterday, where you are clearly in the role of the abuser and they will in they will change with the child between the protector and the victim. So if they make claims that you've abused them, then they are in the victim role and they have to protect the child. If they make claims that you have abused the child, then they're in protector role and the, the um, child is the victim. You remain the abuser and that triangle is intact because it's that trauma reenactment from their own childhood. And it's very hard for you to break that because essentially you're having to prove something that didn't happen. It's hard to get evidence that something didn't happen, isn't it? It didn't snow yesterday, we'll prove it. Well, I can't prove that it didn't snow. I didn't take photos of it not snowing. So it's, it, you're put in, immediately put in a very difficult position. And so what they do from there is that they will convince the child that you are the abuser. And this happens in lots of insidious ways through the contact. And this is where people get confused with parental alienation is they think that well, you're seeing your child so therefore parental alienation can't be happening. Well, actually, it, it does happen because parental alienation is that, that denigration of the relationship. They will do anything they can to ruin that. And in placing you as the bad guy, they that is them ruining your relationship. And they do this through every time you have contact with them, when, when, when they're back with them or when they're visiting them, they will ask, so what have you done together? Um, and then whatever the child says, they will make some snidey comment, make sure that the child knows that they're not happy with that. So the child will then, to appease the parent, because they've learned to be the emotional barometer, they will say something negative about you. Because they know that that gets the best reaction, because the narcissist will suddenly be all, oh, and give him a cuddle and they'll be they'll actually give them the attention that they want and so the child learns that the more bad things they say about you the more attention they get from this otherwise cold and neglecting parent or from this emotionally unstable parent they can stable them off they can level them off and so it starts that's how it starts it starts with that that daily so they're starting this road of you say, them say the child's giving them what they want, they're giving them this bad feedback of, of your behavior, and the child is learning that this is the right way to get the attention. So, it will come a point where those little complaints aren't enough, so they'll up the complaint and it may and it'll be false, they'll make, they'll make something up. So, it might be something really small, like you, you told them that um, they, they needed to put their bike away. And the child will say, oh, we had a small argument because I wanted to put, I didn't want to put my bike away and they told me to. And they will then be digging at that, saying, well, what did they, what did they say? And, oh, that's terrible. That's awful of them. They're so abusive. They don't think about you. They were exactly the same with me. So they create this enmeshment. They create that we're the same. I know what you're going through. They make themselves out to be the nurturing parent because I understand you. I understand how hurt they are. Even though the child probably wasn't even that annoyed in the first place. But because the narcissist is saying all these things, the child suddenly thinks, actually, yeah, I was quite annoyed by that. And this grows and grows and grows in the child's mind until eventually they do end up seeing you as the abuser. They end up seeing you as the bad guy. And eventually they will end up saying that they don't want to see you anymore because you're the, this awful person and services will all get involved and think well the child wouldn't say that they've done this if they hadn't done it which we all know is ridic is ridiculous but that's that's the kind of like the process and I'm, I'm aware that for those of you that are perhaps trying to co-parent that's quite scary but if you're a child of um, a narcissist and you, you've been alienated you may not even know you've been alienated because at the time you may have gone along with it and you may have felt it was absolutely justified and maybe you're looking back now thinking I missed out on a relationship with my mum or with my dad because they told me that they'd done all these things false memory I'm, I'm doing research on false memory and it's incredibly powerful and it's used a lot in 
um, parental alienation cases. And it's really easy to implant a false memory in an adult, but it's particularly easy within a child who is quite malleable. Um, and so you may be an adult child looking back and feeling this deep regret that you, you've missed out. I'm here to tell you, both of you, so if you're a child of an, and you've been alienated but only just realising that, reach out, reach out to your alienated, a, 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 a alienated parent. They will not have stopped thinking about you. They will not have stopped wanting to hear from you. Even if they gave up, they wouldn't have given up out of choice. They, the, they may have given up because they ran out of funds. They may have not even given up. They may have sent letters that you never received. I speak to alienated parents every day and they are doing everything they can. They are fighting. They are bankrupting themselves. They are sending letters. They are doing everything they can to speak to you. So if you are an adult child, reach out to them. I'm sure they will open, welcome you with open arms. For those of you that are attempting to co-parent and are feeling this ramping up, feeling that you're going through that, one of the best things that you can possibly do is to help your child keep a really tight grip on reality. Because the narcissist will be twisting their reality and they'll be doing it in emotional, emotionally blackmailing, psychologically abusive ways. So helping your child have a really good grip on what their reality is, who they are, helping them with those boundaries, helping them to to really when they when they come back to talk through anything, identify what really happened, teach them how to problem solve, teach them how to come up with solutions to issues. <coughs> I apologize. Do everything you can to build their self-esteem, build them up so that they are less inclined. And so that because the narcissist will hate it when it doesn't work. And what what we want is for the child to fight that. We want the child to keep those seeds of who you really are, the parent that you really are. And so that those claims made by the narcissist are so far fetched that they can cling on to reality. And so, like I said, lots of work, lots of special time, lots of appropriate boundaries, lots of play, um, lots of good memories. So that, and build up their self-esteem, build their magic cloak up. I talk about this a lot. Build up their magic cloak so that they are protected from the attacks, protected from the abuse as much as possible. They're not going to get out of this unscathed. And I really wish that, that we could... Um, but they, at the end of the day, they have a narcissist for a parent. It's always going to be hard for them, but there's lots of things you can do. And children with one healthy parent, it actually can develop really good resilience. So it's not it's not negative. All the stuff that you do with your children absolutely makes a huge difference in their in their lives. Resilience is key. There's so much evidence that shows. Having even having a great teacher can build resilience in the most severely neglected children. So having a loving, healthy, nurturing parent will massively help. So keep yourself healthy and make sure that you are doing everything you can for your own self-esteem so that you can model that for your children and help them with that. There is a Thank you for watching. I hope you found that really useful. If you'd like to, me to cover any other topics, please do comment below and let me know what you would like me to cover and I will put videos together based on that. Also, if you could do me a favour and give me a quick thumbs up to let me know that you liked it. And even better, if you could subscribe just to help the channel to reach more people. Thank you for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.